me begin by uh, thanking Chris and his team at LCA for giving me this platform. What I plan to do is to give a view from India of what introduction of African cheetahs means to conservation in our country. India did have cheetahs. These are archival images of wild cheetahs. And this map gives you a reasonably good idea of how widely they were distributed across the country. Covered much of India, overlapped with lions, overlapped with tigers, overlapped with leopards. So it's really human action that caused first the reduction in their distribution and eventually their extinction within the country. Here is an image uh, of captive cheetahs, and you can also see caracals to the right of the image. And this gives you a sense of the number of animals that were taken from the wild for one reason or the other. And here are again photographs. You see a captive cheetah hooded, and the main purpose was what was called a sport then, coursing to capture antelopes like black buck and chinkara. More images of captive cheetahs with their handlers. And the reasons for their decline and eventual extinction is primarily unrestrained capture of both males and females dating back to the 1550s. And then in the late 1800s, the British also declared a bounty on the cheetah. Hunting was always operating on the background. And of course, play, prey was also depleted. And the final push, in some sense, we feel, was the declaration of the bounty because the populations of the cheetahs were already depressed. To kind of give a brief history over the last 80 odd years, it is recorded that on the year that India got independence, 1947, was the last confirmed shooting of live cheetahs, three males in central India. The government officially declared it extinct in 1952, but there were lingering reports. And the last credible report is from 1967. In the late 60s and early 70s, there were efforts between India and Iran to try and get Asian cheetahs from Iran in exchange for Asiatic lions from India. But then political events overtook that. India declared a political emergency. And then in late 70s, the Shah of Iran got overthrown. So clearly conservation wasn't on the top of the agenda. In the late 80s, early 90s, there were some attempts to try and clone the Asian cheetah, subject to getting material from Iran, but that did not fructify. And then in 2009, we had a meeting called for with the support of the government of India to explore the possibility of bringing back the cheetah to India. This resulted in this report published in 2010, it's a joint report of the Wildlife Institute of India, which is an autonomous institution of the government of India, and the Wildlife Trust of India, which is a civil society organization. So this was published in 2010. In the background of all of this, I studied the lines for my PhD going back to the mid 80s. I was in the field between 85, late 85 and early 1990 through the Wildlife Institute of India. And the very purpose of my study was to get a handle on the ecology of the lions, to get real-time information to inform the planning and implementation of the translocation to establish a second free-ranging population of lions. I finished my studies, took my time writing up my thesis, 93 I submitted, and then I went on an 18-month survey looking at potential sites based on recommendations we received from state forest departments 
Based on that, Kuno was chosen and the recommendation was made in January 1995. Since April 1995, Government of India has been investing enormously in preparing Kuno National Park to play host to the Asiatic Lions. But till 2006, for one reason or the other, the Lions didn't come and a public spirited citizen then went to the Supreme Court of India and filed what in India is called as a public interest litigation. The case took its time winding its way through the courts. And in early 2012, I got a call asking me to serve as an expert advisor to the forest bench of the Supreme Court. So between February and I think June of 2012, I live in Bangalore. I was flying at my own cost sometimes once. I mean, most times once, but there were several weeks when I had to go twice a week uh, to Delhi to be in court to advise them. And in 2013, the Supreme Court passed its order. The National Tiger Conservation Authority filed a review petition in 2016. And I will talk a little bit more later about the interim order of the Supreme Court and what is happening to lions today in India. And then of course, there is the 2020 order. And in early January this year, the government of India published the action plan to introduce African cheetahs in India. And in mid-September, we had eight Namibian cheetahs set foot on Indian soil. The Supreme Court judgment of 15th April 2013 was very clear. It ordered the translocation of lions from Gir to Kuno in letter and spirit within six months. From 15th of April 2013, six months was 14th of October 2013. And not long ago, 14th of October 2022 passed, and there's still no signs of the line moving. The, co the court order is very well informed, both in terms of science, policy, as well as legal frameworks and ethical frameworks. It places emphasis on the role of the National Board for Wildlife and then prevailing National Wildlife Action Plan. Just two, three quotes from the order. No state, organization, or person can claim ownership or possession over wild animals in the forest. Animals in the wild are properties of the nation for which no state can claim ownership. And the state duty is to protect the wildlife and conserve it for ensuring the ecological and environmental security of the country. Preservation of an endangered species for which we have to apply the species best interest standard. So very, very clear, very forceful arguments in the order. Not only did they order the translocation of lions, they also struck down the government of India's order to introduce African cheetahs into Kuno. And in legal terms, it's, they said the same is quashed. Based on the Supreme Court order, an expert committee was appointed. I'm a member of this expert committee. Unfortunately, this committee has not even met since December of 2016. And the only reason lions haven't been translocated yet to Kuno is the obduracy of Gujarat state government. They keep throwing the IUCN guidelines quite irresponsibly is what I would say. 1995 to 2022 was nearly 30 years. And a lot has happened in the intervening time. Kuno is ready. 24 villages have been translocated or resettled. More than 1,500 families were resettled. The prey base has increased. The management capacity has improved. Since this is all based on public funding, another public spirited citizen in 2016 filed what's called as a contempt petition for government of India not acting on the 2013 order. But the court dismissed the contempt petition without giving substantive reasons. Why do we want to translocate lions? Conservation of lions is a success. Historically, there are records of lion population being as low as less than 20. To have recovered from such low numbers to now 
700 or more lines is definitely a success, especially given the socioeconomic conditions under which India operates. 1.3 billion people, 50 or more percent of the population living in rural area, dependent on land, agrarian economy. To then be able to successfully conserve a growing population, not just of lions, tigers, leopards, snow leopards, elephants, I could go on. So it's just remarkable. I think there are many, many lessons, not just for Indians to learn, but for the world to learn in terms of coexistence and conservation. But the fact is, whether you have 50 or 500 lions, if you have them all in one site, it's highly risky. And this was demonstrated in 1994 when a canine distemper and babesiosis outbreak in the world's largest lion population in the Mara Serengeti ecosystem resulted in the death of a thousand lions in a few weeks. And India has been in denial, and unfortunately, we had to pay the price for it when in September, October 2018, canine distemper outbreak was recorded in Gir, and officially something like 30 odd lions are dead because of that, but unofficially we know far higher number of lions died. Since 2020, based on the Supreme Court order, the cheetah introduction is another complication that the lions have to navigate. And to me, the situation is no longer about science, conservation, or anything else. It's a standing order of the Supreme Court. So Indian citizenry and the world citizenry and the conservation movement really has to reflect on what respect we have for rule of law. These much stated IUCN guidelines recommend studies in a general sense, and these are not mandatory preconditions for translocation. The guidelines are of two parts, one for a feasibility analysis and the other to guide implementation of translocation and reintroduction. The court, based on the scientific inputs it had received, had already determined the feasibility of the translocation. And the order while describing in line with IUCN guidelines was regarding the implementation of the translocation and not the feasibility analysis, which is why the court very categorically ordered the line should be translocated within six months. If the studies had to be done, how could that be possible in six months? So I'm of the clear and strong opinion that is very, very wrong on the part of state government of Gujarat to continue to stall and challenge the feasibility of the translocation using the IUCA guidelines merely as an excuse. And I'm not crying wolf. These are government numbers reported in the press and not so far ago, long ago. So this is a report from June of 2020. And this is talking of the mortality figures from Jan 1st of January to 31st of May, 2020. And out of those, 50% of the lions died due to diseases. A more recent report, again from the state government of Gujarat, in two years, more than 300 lions have died. And still, they will not even give a dozen or 20 lions to translocate and reintroduce in Kuno to establish a second free-ranging wild population. This is like buying life insurance or medical insurance. This is not at any way to undermine what the people of Gujarat, the government of Gujarat, the government of India, and the larger research and conservation community have achieved, but it's really to manage and sustain this conservation success. And it's very short-sighted to have continue to delay and stall this process. I'm going to show you a few videos, especially for people who are not familiar with India, to get a sense of the current conservation situation of lions. I told you the current population, official number from 2020 is 674, if I remember correctly, but by all reports, it's at least 700 lions or more. And more than 50% of these 700 lions do not live within the wildlife sanctuary or national park. They are outside. And these videos will tell, will give you a 
very, very good idea of what that outside is like. That's a CCTV footage of a hotel and it's 5 a.m. in the morning. Busy road, you can see traffic go by. So that gives you an idea of what the lines and people are going through outside the sanctuary. And that's not one or two lines, it's 300 plus lines. So there is an increase in numbers, so it all looks good, but the increase in the last five years has been primarily outside the forest, which means all, all that you saw just now. So that's a case study to give you a sense of the conservation priority for India today in terms of the line. I'm now going to talk about another species. This is a comparative shot of the same landscape between two years, 2020 and 2022. And what you need to focus on is on the skyline. In 2020, there's nothing on the skyline. What do you see in 2022? High tension power lines crisscrossing. And that is a complete barrier to large flying birds, like the great Indian bustard, which is a highly endangered species, less than 150 birds left in the world. This is again in Rajasthan, Western India, again the same site, comparative pictures, you again see the same problem figuring there. And this is the result. This is a dead great Indian bustard. It's a heavy bird, it's a large bird. Its eyes are to the sides. It cannot see in front. And given its size, the momentum that it has, by the time it sights a high tension power line, it's too late for it. And we cannot afford to lose birds like these. As I said, the world population of great Indian bustards is less than 150. And at this very same site, a couple of years ago, another buster died and the local villagers have erected a memorial for it. And my fear is, if we don't take any action, we might only be left with memorials for this species. And India, and especially people like me, will have the rather dubious distinction of having presided over the extinction of a species. Like in the case of the lions, the Supreme Court of India ordered in April of 2021, which is about 18 months ago, that high tension wires in Great Indian Bustard habitat should be buried underground. In April 2022, a year after their order, they asked for a review. And the government went to the court and said, it is expensive 
to bury power lines. We do not have the funds and hence we've not done it. Which begs the question, what is a priority for India today? Where should we investing our conservation resources? Now, switching back to cheetahs, what is the conservation con context and priority? India's first secretary of the Ministry of Environment and Forest, way back in 1995, said this in the context of cheetahs. The reintroduction project was discussed threadbare during Indira Gandhi's tenure and found to be an exercise in futility. The current justification is it is the only large mammal that's gone extinct in independence India, and hence it's morally binding on us to bring it back. If it was such a priority, one would expect it to figure rather prominently in the Bible for conservation to guide the government's action, which is the National Wildlife Action Plan. And the current plan is valid for the period 2017 to 2031. And this is the plan. This is the cover page of the plan. And there is a section on conservation of threatened species. And what it talks about, I don't know whether you can read 2.2 quite uh, legibly. It says, identify suitable alternate homes for species having one or two isolated populations, such as Jordan's corsa, Buttergold turtle, Asiatic lion, and prepare conservation plans for the same. And what is the timeline allotted to start in 2018 and to be completed by 2021? If you needed more proof of why translocation of lines to Kuno is a priority, you have the 2013 Supreme Court order, and here you have it in black and white in the National Wildlife Action Plan, which, by the way, does not mention cheetahs. One of the arguments presented is the cheetah is a charismatic species. It will attract conservation attention. It's not as if India lacks charismatic species which are endangered, which are native, which are resident, which are inhabitants of grasslands and open natural ecosystems. And here is an extremely short list of those species. Wolves, caracal, great Indian bustard, Asiatic lions, I could go on. What the cheetah project is doing is diverting attention and financial resources from these species. There are various budget estimates for what the cheetah project will need in the next five years. And by the way, this project is planned for something like 50 years. And that's in the region of 55 million US dollars, unprecedented amount of investment. None of our conservation projects ever receive this level of investment. And to prove the fact in terms of charisma, I put together some pretty pictures and I hope you'll agree that it doesn't require cheetahs from Africa to attract attention for conservation in India. Here are wolves, caracal, a live great Indian bustard, and the Asiatic one. And since I've been working with lions, and in many ways, you can call it my favorite species, I'm going to indulge and show you a few more pictures of lions. These are forest dwelling animals. Desert cats. Black buck. Striped hyenas. Desert foxes. While we are investing in Project Cheetah, Project Tiger and Project Elephant, which are flagship projects for India, long-standing projects of India, have faced budgetary cuts. And these are not nominal cuts, 47% cut in financial resource allocation. Now let's take a look at the action plan. As I said, this was released in January of this year. And this is the goal. Establish viable cheetah metapopulation in India 
that allows the cheetah to perform its functional role as a top predator and provide space for the expansion of the cheetah within its historical range, thereby contributing to its global conservation efforts. Laudable voice. I have in italics highlighted some operational terms, viable cheetah metapopulation, perform its functional role as a top predator. And we revisit these. What does the science say? Free ranging wild cheetahs exist in very low densities, at best about one per hundred square kilometers. Kuno National Park, which is the chosen site, is 748 square kilometers, and by a very generous estimate, can play host to about 10 cheetahs. The action plan estimates that there can be 21 cheetahs in the same 748 square kilometers. The numbers don't add up according to me, but that 21 cheetahs in the form of an established population, in the best case scenario, will take 15 years after introducing at least 50 cheetahs from Africa in the next five to 10 years. And if things go well in the larger landscape, then in 30, 40 years, this 21 will grow to 36. Will 36 cheetahs be able to play any ecological role at what scale or what geographical space? We have eight of us published a letter in Nature. I request Marat to share the link in the chat box. This is accessible through that link. And we have advanced our arguments based on science as to why the current action plan leaves a lot to be desired in terms of science, conservation prioritization, and the practicality of getting things done in India. Subsequent to the publication of the action plan, there has been a lot of reporting in the press about this effort. And I take one example from the National Geography. Vincent Mandeman is one of the main proponents along with Adrian and Laurie Marker from Africa to bring African cheetahs to India. And these are verbatim quotes from Vincent's interview. We will lose a tremendous amount of animals. We know this. Given this likelihood, he continues, the focus in India should be on long term, on the long term plan to regularly supply cheetahs from Africa until the species gets a foothold, a goal that will require a minimum of 500 to 1,000 individuals. The action plan talks of 50 cheetahs, but even before the cheetahs are really released, that's gone a tenfold increase and maybe a 20-fold increase. If a cheetah population is successfully established in India, then given the density of humans there, the country's cheetahs will have to be heavily managed with animals exchanged between reserves and even continents. This is completely alien to the way conservation is done in India. We do not have fences. We do not move animals around. I'm not saying it should not be done, but given the resource challenges, given the technical challenges, given the infrastructure challenges, we are light years away from being able to do something like this. Is this the best way of investing in conservation in India? where millions of people live and interact. And as I've shown you, just the line story, elephants live with people, leopards live with people, bears live with people, snakes live with people, and that's the way of life in India. The second objective of the action plan is to use the cheetah as a charismatic flagship, a number of species to garner resources for restoring open forest and savanna systems that will benefit biodiversity and ecosystem services from these ecosystems. This is the kind of habitats they are referring to. There are thousands of square kilometers of such habitats spread throughout India. And a map will illustrate that for you. The map to the left, which is a shade of ochre, shows you open natural ecosystems and grasslands 
spread through the semi-arid zones of India, ideal cheetah habitats. The map to the right is from what is called as the Wasteland Atlas of India. And just by eyeballing, you can see that all, almost all of the open natural ecosystems is actually categorized as wastelands in India. If these ecosystems are so valuable that you need cheetahs from Africa to conserve them, would you, as official policy, categorize them as wastelands? Does it require cheetahs from Africa to change a government categorization from wastelands to a protected habitat? This defies logic to me. And also, who knows somewhere here, if you're going to introduce cheetahs and it's going to take 15 years to have a stable population of 21, which will grow to 36, with luck in 30, 40 years, what about all of the other habitats? When will they get cheetahs and how are cheetahs going to help conserve them? Now, there's a legal angle to all of this. In the 2013 order, the Supreme Court said, at this stage, in our view, the decision taken by the Ministry of Environment for introduction of African cheetahs, first to Kuno and then Asiatic lion, is arbitrary and illegal and clear violation of the statutory requirements provided under the Wildlife Protection Act. The order of MAOEF to introduce African cheetahs into Kuno cannot stand in the way of law, and the same is quashed. The NTCA review petition took the plea that the order of 2013 is not a blanket ban on introduction of cheetahs, African cheetahs in India, into India. It is only saying no cheetahs into Kuno. They submit that they should be allowed to explore other sites and their actions will not adversely impact line translocation. All of this is on record. In an interim order, the Supreme Court says, it may be mentioned that earlier the intention was to import African cheetahs into Kuno. By way of this application, the reintroduction of cheetahs from Africa is sought to be made in some other places, as mentioned in para three of the application. What does para three mean? Pursuant to the above order, efforts have been made to investigate alternate sites for the reintroduction of cheetahs into India, such as Naura Dehi Wildlife Sanctuary in Madhya Pradesh, as well as Satyamangalam Tiger Reserve in Tamil Nadu. The 2016 application review petition of the NTCA was finally decided in 2020, January. And from that order, the Supreme Court said, cheetahs would be introduced on an experimental basis in a carefully chosen habitat and nurtured and watched to see whether it can adapt to the Indian conditions. In case there are some difficulties noticed about the location in which it is introduced, we are informed the location will be changed to another forest, which is more habitable for the animals. But lo and behold, they said, give us permission to survey other sites. But September 2022, the cheetahs have landed in Kuno, the site identified for lions. Now the project proponents, Minister of Environment and others officials are on now record saying, due to delays in lion reintroduction, and who caused those delays? Kuno was considered for cheetah introduction in 2010, and the subsequent NTCA affidavits assert that cheetah introduction will not impact reintroduction. The action plan now says, once a cheetah population is established in Kuno National Park, reintroduction of the lion or colonization by tigers would not be detrimental for cheetah persistence. In other words, it will take at least 15 years for cheetah population to establish itself, then you may consider reintroducing the lions. And talking of the flagship role, I've already talked to you about this. Since the numbers are going to be so low, I don't see what kind of impact it's going to have on wider conservation across geographies in India. My question really is, why Kuno? And to me, the answer is very clear. This is not about cheetah conservation. This is about continuing to stall, delay, and maybe even prevent the reintroduction of lions to Kuno. In August 2020, the Prime Minister announced Project Lion. And the document says they will explore 
reintroduction of lions in multiple sites, including Kuma. But subsequently, in earlier this year, I think in June or July, to a question in parliament, the Minister of State says, we are only looking at sites within Gujarat. And subsequent comments in the media are also only talking about sites within Gujarat. If there were sites within Gujarat, what has prevented the state government from establishing alternate population? And then what value does the Supreme Court order of 2013 have? Or what value does the National Wildlife Action Plan have? Talking about Kuno, you might as well get a peek into what Kuno habitat looks like. This is the Kuno River, which is a main tributary of one of our cleanest river systems, the Chambal River system. A couple of views of its habitat, ranges from grasslands to dry deciduous forests to fairly wet areas also. In conclusion, I just want to give you a sense of what conservation in India is like. This is a photograph of a dead leopard. But look at what the old woman is doing. She's praying to it. And look at the curiosity and attention that the children around her are paying. This is my first photograph of lion, December of 1985. I grew up in what was then called Madras and today Chennai. I am a city boy. Cricket was my main passion. I didn't even know when I grew up that I could make a career in wildlife. One thing led to another. I got a break. I did a master's in wildlife biology, joined the Wildlife Institute. I was assigned the lions for my research. And in December of 85, I was sent on a recce. Four days I was there, walking, spending the night in the forest, heard them roar, saw their tracks, saw their uh, scats, saw kill remains, but the lions remained elusive. This was my last evening. I was walking on the road with a local village boy as my guide, and out of the bush, four lions emerged. And I was scared. This is the first time I was seeing large cats, large wild cats at close quarters. They were about 50, 60 meters away from me, but they were moving what seemed with a sense of purpose towards us. I looked at this guy and said, what should we do? He just put his uh, finger on his lip, so I held my breath, kept quiet. The lions kept coming. It took me a few minutes to realize I had a camera, I had a binoculars, I was supposed to be a researcher. I really should be observing and taking pictures and so on. By the time I focused, three of the lines disappeared, but I'm very proud of this picture. It took me about six months to do this. This is not trying to be a hero, but it is dense bush. If you need to identify lines, you need to get pretty close up. And these lines are special. They allow this kind of approach. They are wild. They are not domesticated. They are not trained. I don't think they ever recognize me. I think they recognize non-threatening behavior. Here is a suburb male sleeping on a hot summer afternoon. I took this picture. He heard the shutter go and look at his response. Not anger, not aggression, not fear, curiosity. And that's my own shadow. It's a wide angle picture of an adult male. It's a negotiated settlement. It took me about two hours to get there. Don't ask me why I did it. I was young and wild and crazy. Thank you very much. I would like to acknowledge all these people who helped me in so many ways, including contributing information, photographs, and having supported my work through these decades. Over to you, Chris. Okay, there's a first one there. Lorraine Chitok and Yuan, please uh, over to you also for the questions and answers. Uh, over to Lorraine, we're asking you to unmute. Lorraine is from Arusha and Tanzania. Thank you, Lorraine. That was wonderful, Ravi. Thank you so much. Um, I'm wondering, you know, I know there's a problem with leopards in Mumbai, for example. How, how do people in villages, how were they feeling about the possibility of introduction to, of cheetahs? I can't imagine it would be very positive. Um, there has been some consultation, not a whole lot, 
It is also not clear what the government is planning in the larger landscape. As of now, as we speak, one village is being relocated. If they want to work through the larger landscape, you're talking of 169 villages. So oh there is a challenge. Yeah. I think in this day and age, we need to move beyond fortress conservation approaches, especially in a country like India, where we have succeeded in conservation in great part because of the manner in which local communities relate to nature as a whole. I have been to places like Yellowstone where the boundary is sacrosanct. An animal can be six inches within the national park or six inches outside and its fate is decided. In India, a tiger can be in your bedroom and it receives full legal protection. The only way you can defend yourself, I mean, in defending yourself, you can kill it. But otherwise, the law is on the side of the animal. And that's also the normal attitude. Most, I mean, there are problems. I, I will not say there are no problems, but given the scale of the problem, I think we have done a tremendous job. So continuing to disempower local communities, continuing to clear them out in the name of conservation, I think raises deep moral and ethical issues. I, I have a, a second very quick question. Is it, is it true that wildlife areas in India are completely devoid of people? Like you're not, you can't drive around? The answer is That's no. why. Uh, tourists are, in fact, one of the objectives of the cheetah introduction is tourism to generate economic revenue. So we have at least four categories of protected areas. The strictest protection is given to national parks and tiger reserves, which technically says there should be no human presence, no human action, climate, climate change notwithstanding, uh, which anyway, local people are not responsible for. Uh, wildlife sanctuary, community reserve, uh, conservation reserve or other categories of protected areas, all of which allow some form of human use. Thank you, Ravi. Thank you, Lorraine. I'm putting you back on mute. Yuan, over to you. Philip Duffy's got his uh, hand up. Uh, we're going to go GDB and then we go Willem Dafu, Yuan, and then also check for us the chat, please. So I'm going to ask whoever GDB is to unmute, please. And uh, I just want to clear my screen here. Where did that jump to now? Uh, GDB, let's just see. Yes, uh, I managed to, to unmute myself. My name is uh, George Dian Balan. I, um, I really appreciated this presentation and I find it, uh, you know, very interesting. Uh, but uh, the question is, if not in Kuno, where in India uh, do do you think that uh, cheetah could find a suitable place? Because they belong to India, they were there, uh, they were taken out just as a consequence of human intervention. So I think it's normal that they should be back somewhere there. So this is my question. Thank you. I think it's a really a question that we need to ask the project proponents, simply because. The first step should have been to identify, secure, and prepare the habitat and not get the animals. Now, as I said, we are kind of being presented with a fait accompli. And as I said also, I don't think this is about conservation of cheetahs. This is about stalling reintroduction of lions. So I don't have an answer. I have shown you a map of both the former distribution of cheetahs as well as the distribution, current distribution of open natural ecosystems, which can serve as potential habitats for cheetahs. We have to do the hard, painstaking, time-consuming work, dirty, non-glamorous work of doing the surveys finding the connections, securing those habitats, negotiating with local communities, using them, investing in that, 
And once the habitat is secure, once the prey populations are back, once the human communities in that area are accepting of cheetah in their presence, then you have your answer. Thank you. Um, I am going to give Willem Dafoe chance for a question, then Paul Telfer, Jan, and then you must take some questions out of the chat because it means, seems to me there's quite a number of questions there. Uh, Willem, please, over to you. Can you hear me? We can Robin, hear. No, thank you very much. It's a, it's, it's a fantastic talk. Uh, one thing you didn't mention is the genetic makeup. Another reason why we should not introduce cheetahs from South Africa. Will you just uh, uh, maybe explain a little bit on that? Uh, Willem, I'm not the best person. If uh, Gus is online, I think you guys in South Africa know this better. Can I call on Gus? Thank you, Ravi. Uh, good evening. Um, yeah, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very difficult question, but the point is that there are subspecies and we tend to look at the genetics but forget the functional reasons for these genetic differences. Animals from Southern Africa have adapted to the particular environment and conditions that they live in, which are very different from conditions which would you would find in India. In fact, you couldn't be further away. You couldn't get subspecies further away from Southern Africa and India. And so we need to look at, if we don't know and we're not sure about the functional significance of these differences in, in the subspecies, I think it's very dangerous to start um, playing around and, and mixing them. And the truth is that with more patience, with more time, uh, there could well have been, e even assuming that the area was suitable and was well prepared and was a good area, which is, as Ravi has shown us, quite debatable, um, then perhaps one could, could consider uh, getting those correct genetic stock or the, a better, a more closely related genetic stock and using them in, 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 the, in the exercise. Thanks, Gus. Um, question from Paul Telfer, Dr. Paul Telfer, please, from West Africa, presently in Nairobi. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, thank you, Ravi. That was an amazing presentation, and um, I really appreciate the passion and the, and the factual nature of it. Um, it's a conservation dilemma, but one of the issues you raised still remains outstanding in my mind is why is there such a reluctance to translocate these lions it's the political issue apparently and is there some political forces there that uh, you can make us aware of as to why this is not happening i mean there was a supreme court decision the the, the, the area is ready and and now they're trying to do something else and you say the cheetah issue is there to prevent this why are is there such opposition Ignorance, false pride, some notion of doing good. Is there a role for civil society outside of India to play, to put pressure on the powers to be, that, the powers that be to make this happen? Saying, uh, Paul was saying, could international civil society put pressure and I said, I wouldn't use the term put pressure, but make them see reason. I think there is always value for reason and logic and persuasion. Great. Thank, thank you. you, Ravi. You on the chat, please. Um, yes, I apologize in advance if I mispronounce anybody's name. Um, I think this is just the question in, in, in search of clarity. Uh, Venkat, um, I understand that it was not a positive move, but now that it has been executed, what is your recommendation to make it work? Or is it that it just cannot work? Uh, science has informed us, and I've given you my analysis of the action plan. As of now, 
we have eight cheetahs from Namibia. They are still in quarantine, even though about two weeks ago, they were supposed to go into the larger enclosure. I don't know whether it's happened in the last 24, 48 hours. We don't, we haven't seen that in the press at least. I would suggest we do a pause, take stock, not treat it as a prestige issue, recalibrate and get it right. Unlike the lions, and, or more importantly, unlike the great Indian bustards, there are 7,100 plus cheetahs in dozens of sites. It cannot be such a tearing urgency that it can supplant conservation action for great Indian bustards or for Asiatic lions for the reasons I've already outlined. Do a rethink, do a better job. We've outlined things in the letter we published. I've given you some examples. Gus has also talked about how we can get it right. I think that's the way to do it. Have wider consultation, involve more people. There is no shame in doing that. Thanks, Ravi. Next question, Jan, and then we're going to uh, allow for comments, please. Um, Chris from Jesslina Suri. I don't know if I agree on the point that it's about stalling. It seems more like it is about vanity and novelty. But since you say so, why would they want to stall on the lion introduction? That's the first question. Yeah, that's, uh, I think the other question is more directed. It's a sort of an internal debate in, in, in the chat at the moment. But let's, let's go with that. Why would they want to stall on the lion introduction? Well, the cheetahs have come only in 2020. The stalling has started way back, right? I mean, going back to 2013. I've already talked to why. I mean, there's, we are looking for logic in a situation where none exists. I mean, if you look, if you approach it logically, we will not get answers. Uh, this, this definitely escapes logic. This isn't acting with impunity. It's in defiance of a Supreme Court order. Thank you, Ravi. Thanks, Ravi. Okay, let's get our hands raised for people who would like to make any comments. Welcome to do so. Uh, we're going to uh, start with Adrian, uh, then Louise Deval, then Robin Cook, uh, and Manawick, Kelly. There are four. Okay, let's start with Adrian. Please unmute uh, Adrian uh, Murray. Um, thanks, Ravi. Um, I understand this is a, a really complex political issue, but you know, sometimes in conservation, we really have to play with the politics that we have. And, um, you know, I've been to areas in India, uh, areas that are, have, are overrun by cattle that really are not owned by anyone, feral cattle that are overgrazing areas. These are protected areas or so-called protected areas that uh, the local conservation authorities really have no interest in actually protecting um, because they would become in conflict with the villagers. Um, once you start introducing, and, and one of them is like uh, the one near the area near Ganisaga Dam, uh, I've seen that it's absolutely not a blade of grass. There are virtually no birds, you know, certainly no Indian bastards, you know, and, and if you now had to introduce a cheetah into that area and you, you provided the actual political will to conserve it, I mean, obviously it needs something to eat. So it's going to need some antelope to eat, um, Indian blackbuck or chinkara or chital. Then you would have to make sure there's grass there, which means you have to move the cattle out of those reserves. Uh, India is one of the highest cattle populations in, in the world. Um, and yet they're completely underutilized, um, you know, for religious uh, reasons. But the problem is that has a massive impact on, on conservation. Now, in order to create the will to do it, my belief is that the cheetah would provide something like that. I mean, you talk about the caracal, you talk about the Indian busted, you talk about the Indian wolf, uh, all great species and all need protection, but none of them are really going to capture the uh, minds of the people in India as much as the cheetah. Uh, once, because we know it's probably in the top four of the charismatic species, um, probably you know, only behind the tiger. And the other thing is that, you know, it's the species that only species, mam great mammal that's gone extinct in, you know, modern day India. So 
you know, it, those factors together create an impetus for um, conservation. And I, I certainly believe that we have to play with the politics that we have. You know, sometimes uh, the other comment I was just going to make is moving lions from Gujarat, you know, into Rajasthan or into Madhya Pradesh. I mean, maybe fine, but you've already, they died of what? Distemper. Distemper occurs in all of those other, in the dog population, the feral dog population, which they are plenty. So, you know, moving one population to another area in the country of India is not going to protect them against, you know, distemper. You would need to have a vaccination campaign. Um, and certainly the, the issue with, with regards to cheetahs uh, in uh, Kuno National Park is not necessarily going to preclude the, the possibility of moving uh, lions eventually there. The only thing, the advantage of doing cheetahs first is that you can establish a, a slightly weaker species in the area first, get them to utilize the, the area, inhabit the area. And the last point I would like to make um, is just that the, the, the population densities that you're talking about, one cheetah per 100 square kilometers, may be true for the Serengeti, and we might talk about that as a, a high production area, maybe for Wilderpierce and, and for Zebra, but not for, not for uh, the, the, the Thompson's gazelle. Um, these are bulk species that eat fairly poor, you know, quality grass, um, but are, are prey species for lion and, um, and not for cheetahs. So in South Africa, we achieve much higher densities. Yes, sometimes they're in fenced reserves, but the growth, the population growth rates are massive uh, in, in many of our South African reserves. So in a higher production uh, system, which I believe that Kino Kuno is, I'm pretty sure we can uh, achieve much higher population densities of cheetahs. So I, I, I don't really see that we need to fight against each other in terms of this. I think that we can certainly ride on the back of the cheetah uh, project in order to achieve many of the conservation goals. Thank you, Adrian. I see three questions there. And as you saw in my presentation, my question is not about why cheetahs. My question is why Kuno? Cool? Please focus on Gandhi Sagar. Please focus on wherever else. By all means, is the habitat ready? The answer is no. Why are we rushing with cheetahs? That is the question I have. Let me be very clear. I am advocating for line translocation on for the prevalence of rule of law. I am not saying don't bring the cheetahs. If you have the will, if you have the resources, if you have the expertise, more strength to your elbow, knees, and all other joints in your body. I have no in principle objection. I don't know enough about the genetics. I leave it to the other experts. I am fighting for the lions. And I see, I repeat, I see this as an attempt to only stall, delay, and possibly prevent the translocation of lions. And I see this based on evidence in answers to questions in parliament, in public statements of responsible government officials and ministers, who should know better than to be acting and stating things with such impunity. And Adrian, you should realize I have lived all my life, worked in India and traveled reasonably well and have a pretty good understanding of how India functions, both from a conservation perspective, from a political perspective and equally from an ecological perspective. So I just want to make clear that since 18, 1980, I've been in this field. And it's not that I've been retired or anything like that. The second point you talk about lions coming to Kuno and the prevalence of disease and all of that, that equally operates for cheetahs. It's not peculiar to lions. Then why are no, we it's bringing... Not. It's not. Cheetahs don't get distemper, by the way. But, but, just, just but, they will get, but there would be other diseases. It's not as if the rest of our uh, domestic animals are bereft of diseases. They're not social okay. animals. They, they don't, the disease is not even mentioned. Two lines in IUCN risk assessment in terms of cheetahs. Okay, it's, sorry. Disease I'm is mistaken. not an issue in cheetahs. Okay, I am mistaken. Let's, but I go back to the fact that it's a rule of law issue. I concluded my arguments by saying the science, the conservation is all being done and dusted. It's a standing order of the Supreme Court. And as a citizen of India, I will continue to advocate for rule of law. On the last point of density fence reserves, I will defer again to experts like Gus Mills. This is not an area of my expertise or knowledge. Gus, if you could respond to Adrian's comment. I think the aim of cheetah conservation should be to create areas for free-ranging cheetahs that are large enough 
to carry out their functional role in ecosystems without management. I think we must go for quality, not quantity. Metapopulation is characterized by a number, in South Africa at any rate, by a number of small, highly managed reserves that are fenced. These are really not much better than glorified safari parks because there's intensive management of the animals. There is prey, often substituted prey. Other predators' numbers are limited. Cheetah numbers are limited. And one of the reasons why there's a surplus of cheetahs is because we do not have functional systems where cheetahs would be regulated by the natural processes. And I would like to point out that and, and, and advocate that in, in certainly in the metapopulation program that we're running in South Africa, we need to think about taking down fences between areas. There's a great reluctance because of private ownership not to do that. So they would rather have one or two token cheetahs in the area that can show their tourism, but it's not a functional ecosystem. And we really need to try and get what I think are functional ecosystems going. Sure, Gus, but, but there are no, I mean, every single cheetah population other than in Southern Africa is in decline at the moment, even in, in those large ecosystems that we're talking about. It's, it's, we, it's not working. The, the height of, of stupidity is when you keep doing the same thing and expect some sort of different result. So for me- Sorry, Adrian, I just, uh, not, you say every population outside South Africa is declining. Where do you get those figures from, if I may ask? Tell me which, give me one that is actually growing. We are now below 7,000 already if you go and look at the IUCN website. I mean, and if, even in Namibia, the stronghold, we, I mean, we, we can ask any of the Namibians that are online, tell me which, which, which population is actually growing. The East African population is in decline. They are not, they are not stable populations. The, East, the, the populations in the protected areas are, being, are, 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 are not increasing necessary because they are in balance with the environment and that's what we want to we want to have we want to have cheetahs living in functional systems where they can carry out their ecological roles in as as they evolve to do so you know to say you get surplus numbers from your metal population the reason why you get and you want to move them to other areas it's just creating numbers, but it's not creating functional biodiversity. And I think that's where okay. we- Okay, thank you for that, Gus. Thank you, Adrian. Let's move to Louise Deval. And also to everybody, thank you for this uh, very uh, interesting and, uh, and mutually respectful debate. Really appreciate that. Let's go over to Louise Deval. Good evening. Thank, thank you, Ravi. I think it's 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 such an interesting debate, and there's certainly two sides to this story. And I think we're sort of slowly moving to the other side of this story, which is the South African and the Namibian side of the story. Um, and I think we don't, haven't done our homework either in terms of these relocations. Um, Vincent van der Merwe was actually quoted by yourself, Rafi, as stating that it may need uh, 500 to 1,000 cheetahs to establish a viable population of maybe 21 cheetahs. Now, that may be a bit of an exaggeration. I don't know. I don't think anybody knows, really. But uh, do we even have the surplus that we seem to be talking about and these massive growth rates, do we even have sufficient numbers of cheetahs to keep on moving to India to establish a meta population there? If we actually are introducing captive bred cheetahs in our meta population in South Africa as we speak, because there's I quote, not sufficient numbers to be relocated to those areas. So I think we have to sort of widen this whole debate around this topic to the African side as well and look at what it could potentially do for the cheetah population in Southern Africa, um, because I don't agree with massive, massive growth rates and surplus of of cheetahs if we're actually using captive bred cheetahs to introduce them into our meta population. Um, 
And I think we also need to sort of look at the welfare issue. And that is something that is very often overlooked in conservation terms. And if we have such high mortality um, and we keep on moving, translocating cheetahs under hugely high stress situations, um, thousands of miles to the other side of the world. Stress is also inducing all sorts of diseases. And Adrian, you should uh, are better judge to that than I am, but I've, I've read a number of articles about stress and cheetah and the um, which can create all sorts of diseases and 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 uh, creating mortality during and uh, after translocation. So I think there's also, in my mind, a welfare issue associated to projects like this. Um, so yeah, that's just some points that I would like to put out there. And if anybody would like to comment, um, I would really be appreciative. Thank you. Thank you, um, Ravi. I'm going to leave this um, comment to the bigger group of um, a person to comment on that. And then we move on to the next um, uh, input from Robin Cook. Uh, Adrian, do you want to comment? Uh, have any comments on that? Can I ask you to unmute? Uh, yes. So first of all, we, in terms of numbers, we in the meta population now, um, the growth rate has, is now 8.8% .8 per year. And that comes from a base of about 500 animals um, spread out in 50 or so reserves. So we, if you just do the maths, you're looking at about 50, 60 surplus cheetahs uh, within the South African system. Now, there are very few new reserves that are coming on board to take cheetahs within South Africa. So we actually will be sitting with a surplus. And the situation is such that we will probably, I mean, we, we've exported cheetahs to Malawi, to Mozambique, to Zambia. Uh, and many of those introductions have been successful of 70 reintroductions across Southern Africa. I think only two have not been successful. Uh, and we have fairly good ideas as to why that is the case. But the point is that if we don't reintroduce these cheetahs, move them out now to new reserves, and there are no places in Africa that are sufficiently protected. Uh, you talked about welfare issues. It absolutely is a welfare issue if we're just going to be moving animals into unprotected areas where there is insufficient monitoring and where they're just going to get caught in snares or be killed. So that's absolutely not going to happen. But if we didn't do that, we're going to have to start putting some of these cheetahs uh, in small reserves in South Africa on contraceptives to control the population in order to make sure that we don't end up with an, a surplus population. So yes, it is highly managed, um, but I think that's the way the world is going. You know, managed populations, we, we love to have pristine wilderness and all the rest of that. That's not the reality of 90% of, of, of the world that we live in. Um, the issue with regards to stress, stress, yes, could be a, a big problem in captive cheetahs. And yes, there is quite substantial stress during translocation, which is something that I've been working on quite um, aggressively to try and reduce that. I think we've managed to demonstrate that in the recent translocations and certainly in this trans first trans translocation of the Namibian cheetahs um, very successfully with the use of tranquilizers and so on to keep these animals um, sedated during the translocation. Um, and yes, the, everything is done to try and reduce the actual stress and to minimize that risk to disease. So I think we absolutely are taking that into consideration. It's, it's a high priority, certainly for me. Good, Robin Cook, you were very patient and thanks for Mauna Week and Anne Schmick Mürzel uh, for your patience. Robin, you are unmuted. Uh, yeah, we go again, just accept unmute and then you can over to you, Robin, welcome. My name is actually Simon Naylor. I'm the conservation manager for uh, Pinder Private Game Reserve. I've been the manager here for 16 years. Um, and, and I think my, my comment is, or just a, just a few comments on, uh, I mean, I'm not qualified to speak of the, the politics, the Indian politics with regards to, to lions and, and cheetah for Kuno, but I just wanted to highlight the, um, the similarities of this proposed or translocation that's, that's taking place to what happened here 30 years ago. Now, Pinda is, is a private reserve uh, in KwaZulu-Natal where where actually cheetah went extinct sort of 100 years ago. 
Pinda was a, a very small reserve. Uh, it was actually degraded old farmland. Uh, very little wildlife existed here. And attempts were made to introduce cheetah into this province uh, in the 80s and 90s unsuccessfully uh, until Pinda was created. And actually the first, the, 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 the original 12 Pinda, uh, cheetah to Pinda actually came from Namibia. Uh, they came from, from Dr. Laurie Marker. And it has been one of the most successful uh, sort of restoration projects in, in South Africa. It was one of the pioneers uh, to restore, you know, degraded land, farmland, wildlife land. And I just wanted to highlight the, the example that we are and, and many other reserves in South Africa are specifically for, for the success of introduction of cheetah and the, um, you know, the success that has come from it. I think it was only after 10 years of, of Cheetah being here. And I think many of you will know Dr. Um, Dr. Luke Hunter. He does PhD on the introduction of Cheetah and lions here. And I think the, 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 um, the, you know, to introduce Cheetah, one of the biggest successes of the introduction of Cheetah here was doing them before the lions. Um, so that Cheetah had an opportunity to settle and, and sort of sort of settle in before other predators arrived. Since then, uh, we have translocated uh, more, probably close to about 150 cheetah outside of, out of Pinda uh, to other parks within South Africa, to Mozambique, to Malawi, to Zambia. Uh, and, and actually some of our cheetah are destined to, to go to India, um, hopefully shortly. But I just wanted to, to raise the example of what can be achieved um, and uh, and just to highlight that there is actually, I think the, the habitat is 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 probably so uh, so distinct between Namibia and Zululand, you can't get actually a, a greater difference. And cheetah are very very adaptable animals. The cheetah from the semi desert uh, habitat of of Namibia very very quickly were hunting in the sand forest uh, of of Pinda and. Yeah, it's been an incredible success. Uh, and the Pinder project itself has been an incredible success. And that has been based on, uh, a lot of it has been on the success of Cheetah here. And, and Pinder is one of the, the best places to view Cheetah actually in Africa. Um, and, and since then we've, we've, we've had, uh, you know, very successful lodges. And I think, uh, yeah, I think, um, you know, Many, many, there were many critics when, when, when Pindo uh, received, first received Cheetah here and they've been proven wrong. And, and I think, um, you know, unless, unless the people back then made those brave decisions, uh, we wouldn't be where we are today. And, and Pindo has made an incredible contribution uh, to cheat, of Cheetah to South Africa and, and Southern Africa. Um, so I just wanted to make, make those comments and highlight what was achieved here 30 years ago, and that's all well, very well documented. I mean, you just have to go and read Dr. Luke Hunter's PhD, um, you know, on the, on the introduction and the methodologies and what happened there. Um, and I've seen the habitat in Kuno, and it's actually better habitat than, it's more, more open um, uh, than actually Pinda. Pinda's even thicker, uh, thicker than, than Kuno is, and, and obviously much smaller. Um, I mean, there's a lot of similarities. There's obviously a lot of differences, but I have no doubt that the cheetah will uh, will survive and, and do very well in the habitat and the food that's available there. And just to highlight as well that the cheetah we have here at Pinda survive and produce and breed successfully uh, with a greater concentration and density of other carnivores. We have lots of very high concentrations of lion, leopard, spotted hyena, and actually much higher, much greater than in Kuno. So I really don't think there will be, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, an issue with, with, with other predators. Um, so that's just, yeah, just the comments quickly that I wanted to make. Um, there are many examples of successful cheetah reintroductions in, in Southern Africa and Africa um, and, and the similarities to, to India. Thank you. Thank you. I had the pleasure of visiting Pinda with Luke, spent, uh, I think, four days in 1995. Uh, this was my introduction to moving large cats. We actually moved a male lion uh, to Bombay uh, from uh, Pinda. 
Uh, but Simon, this is not engaging with the issues I've raised. Uh, my answer are going to be similar to what I gave to Adrian. Why Kuma? Thank what you. about rule of law? Where is the Supreme Court order with this? What is the order of prioritization? And that I think is for India to answer. Thank you, Ravi. Uh, Willem, did you raise a finger? Because I don't see your... Uh, come in, please, Willem. Yes, yes. Uh, I think it is just the wrong cheetah. I mean, cheetahs can adapt. For me, it's the wrong cheetah. It's my personal opinion. It's not the right genetics. It's, it's the pro priorities here is the first priority is the, the Iranian uh, cheetah, the Asian cheetah. There's less than 20. That's first priority. Second priority is the lines of go. That is for me the second. Priority. And then we can always go back. If all the, those two uh, failed, then we can introduce the cheetah from Southern Africa. And I just would like to have Ravi's uh, 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 opinion on that. No, I mean, if whatever process they've gone through to decide to bring South African, Southern African cheetahs. My question is why Kuma? When we know that all the efforts on the legal position on Kuno is, and as I said, the review petition said, give us permission to survey sites other than Kuno. So, you know, it's, it's kind of, Hoping people will only have selective memory, will not stay with the issue, will not read the documents. This is a game of smoke and mirror. And I don't want, as a citizen of, of India, to be played around like this. It is extremely disappointing that the international community, which should know better than to play around with rule of law in another country. Thank you. Uh, can okay. I just say another thing? I see, Adrian, sorry. I saw your comment on uh, only the three females. There is another female uh, 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 in captivity as well. And if you think about it, I mean, the Asian lines came from less than 20, probably only 11. So it's still there. It's still a possibility. But if they are extinct and there's no uh, Asian uh, uh, cheetahs, then you can think about it after you reintroduce the, uh, the lines to a second uh, population. And that is just my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Willem. Kelly Marnaby, Marnaby Kelly, you've been waiting a long time. Please, you are nearly, there you are. You are live on. Thank you. Thanks hey, for your Thank patience. you very much. Thanks everybody, it's been a really cool discussion. Um, a couple of things, I mean, I think Louise, who came a few people before me, spoke about many of my concerns around the South African context, which I believe we should be concerned with. Um, I don't know if that quote by Vincent van Amerva is accurate, that they need a thousand cheetahs to create that population in India. If so, where on earth are we going to get those? And what are the impacts on cheetahs going to be in South Africa? And I don't know if, if that includes Namibian cheetahs, I don't know. Um, yes, there are some reserves that do exceptionally well in the meta population. Pinda is, is mind-blowing and, and they do fabulous work there. And they've, they've certainly done some really, really great stuff and they are a great source for cheetahs in the meta population. But how come with 30 captive bred cheetahs introduced into the meta population in South Africa over the last what, two or three years because they need a genetic diversity and we needed more animals was the motivation for that. So it appears to me that there's just these... Um, um, Ravi used the word smoke and mirrors just now. It doesn't appear that anything has been done in a really clear manner. Um, there's a lot of contro uh, controversy around this, even in South Africa. You talk to people in the conservation sector, and a lot of people are talking about this and very unhappy with it. So my question, Ravi, is has there been any um, feedback from the specialist groups like the IUCN CAT specialist group and the IUCN reintroduction specialist groups around this? And have they had any formal communication around this. And I also see the NGOs in South Africa are silent on this, and I, I don't know why. No one is standing up and saying it's fabulous, and no one is standing up and saying it's awful. So I'm just curious. Thank you. Thanks, I, Kiri. Uh, Ravi? I did, I did write to the co-chairs of the CAT specialist group. I got an acknowledgement after I sent a reminder. That's the level of engagement I've had. Silence or people not wanting to engage with me. I don't know. I mean, they might be talking amongst themselves. I put everything out. Uh, I haven't had anything in writing coming back to me. 
what they say without me hearing it, I wouldn't know. And I'm not in the business of trying to find out. Thank you, Ravi. Um, can I jump and... in again? Sorry, Kelly. Sorry, can I, can, I, can I just add on to that? You, you're welcome, and then we give yeah. Anne a chance. Thank you, I'll be quick. Yeah, Ravi, I mean, a couple of years ago in my previous role, um, in my previous organization, this project came across my desk then, and I gave it a hard no at the time. And um, I also asked for all sorts of opinion piece, uh, opinions from various organizations. The people are reluctant, and, and I'm not sure why. So anyways, yeah, maybe we can we can discuss this offline, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Thank you. I mean, uh, else you can get my email ID and connect with me. Yeah, I, I can. can uh, Thanks, Ravi. I'm, I'm just going to dare to raise my opinion here. Having been in the NGO space for many, many years, NGOs tread very, very lightly. Very lightly. You depend on sponsorships, you depend on people's opinions, you get an opinion that is strong or this side or that side, and NGOs play the game very, very safely simply because they have to survive as NGOs. That's my opinion. NGOs hardly ever really take a very strong stance, um, but that is my personal opinion. And Schmidt, over to you, please. Um, I'm asking you to unmute, just accept unmute. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to um, say a little bit of something because you were looking for geneticists earlier, so I felt obligated to um, reply I'm a geneticist with the Cheetah Conservation Fund. And so first, thank you for the, for the presentation. And it, you know, I think as has been pointed out before, we are all conservationists. We all want all the species to do well, and it is not a competition between species. It's very sad to hear the plight is the, that the line has gone through and that it still has not happened. And so I think that from the cheetah side, of course, we're very happy that it was able to go forward in terms of, in a passive way, I should emphasize, because I think you were also talking about the international community and that it is an Indian decision. And I think it always has been. As you said, it's something that was decided by, well, you know, more than me, I'm not gonna say that. I think everybody here knows, but you know, that it was decided by the Indian Supreme Court and so from our side, we've just supported what was decided and we're pleased about it. It is very saddening to hear that it was harmful to the lions, if that is the feeling. And it's nice though to hear that you're also supportive of the cheetah coming back. I think it's amazing that India has only less, lost the cheetah as carnivore in such a populated country. I mean, that is really an amazing feat for that country. And so I think it's, it's laudable and it's nice that the in, Indian country has wanted cheetahs back. Um, where to put them again was something there's Kuna is not the only site. Um, and so hopefully that will not, you know, the, the other sites will work as well, also in terms of fire carrying capacity. But I guess my main point is just to say that, you know, of course everybody is supportive of everybody, all the other species as well. And hopefully being a flagship species, it might help, like in the reserves in South Africa, that the lions might be able to jump on the wagon since they haven't made it yet. Hopefully they'll be able to come in later um, in Kuno and elsewhere. And just as a geneticist, I wanted to say, yes, they're different subspecies. Um, but then the specialization, we do not know. And so we will probably not know for the next, you know, for the next foreseeable future. And that's always the question, that specialization that we do not know about, if we wait for it, we will be waiting much longer than the lines. Nothing will ever happen because those are very, very difficult traits to identify. You need, you need to get, we don't even know everything for humans. And so, and as we do know, they're very plastic in their adaptation to environments. They, they adapt to a lot of very different environments, each subspecies. And so we're, we're very hopeful, of course, nobody can know, but we're very hopeful that they will be able to adapt very well to other environments as well. So we're hoping that it'll be, yeah, that it will be, you know, that it will be helpful to your cause as well. Thank you, Anne. Ravi, any comment on your side? The same, I mean, my answers are going to be somewhat similar. Okay. Why who know? And it is, I don't think, accurate to say India as a country, it's the government decision. 
it is not a decision arrived at by careful consideration and consultation. And the Supreme Court order did not say introduce in Kuno when the plea was for sites other than Kuno. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Yuan, I'm, I'm not sure on your side what is happening in the chat. I believe the chat is very busy. Anything you want to raise there? Then I'm going to give Rajat Gai an opportunity because Rajat has not had a chance. Um, uh, please, Yuan, anything on your side? Question that Ravi would love to answer from David Zimmerman. How many lions could Kuno sustain? And would the risk of human wildlife conflict be greater if lion reintroduced? The later half first. In India, conflict is a state of mind, depending on which section of society, class of society you belong. In Bangalore, where I live, a snake in your backyard, even a non-venomous snake, is seen as conflict. For people in rural India, large mammals, including elephants, walking through the landscape is not necessarily conflict. Lions and livestock will result in conflict. I'm in no position to give a quantitative answer to this. With about 800 square kilometers of Kunu, our estimate is roughly 70 to 80 adult lines. Thank you. Rajat Gai, if I pronounce your surname correct, please come in. I'm asking you to unmute. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. I just had one observation and one um, query. The observation is that everybody from uh, South Africa and other African countries, they were asking why was the uh, translocation of lions from Gir to Kuno prevented? Maybe I can shed some light on that because the current prime minister of the country was at that time the chief executive of Gujarat state. And he built uh, the narrative that uh, keeping the lions inside Gujarat, inside Gir, was a matter of Gujarati pride, a pride for the Gujarati ethno-linguistic group of uh, this country. Uh, so basically it was just keeping the novelty factor of gear that it, it has been touted as the only place in the world where you can see Asiatic lions in the wild. Uh, but that was uh, converted into a whole different narrative. And of course, uh, the rest is history now because uh, that uh, the, the gentleman is now the prime minister of India. Secondly, I just wanted to ask Dr. Chellam and uh, other experts, uh, uh, there has been an expose in the Indian press, in the Indian Express uh, uh, specifically, that uh, there was a quid pro quo between Namibia and India on the question of Namibia uh, sending lions to India in return yes. for ivory, uh, the ban on lifting on the ban on the on ivory. If somebody could respond to these, uh, what this is about, uh, and because we are going to have the CITES conference uh, next month in November, mid-November, if somebody could uh, shed some light on this. Thank well, you. I can give I can give you a quick uh, response that. This ivory issue has been in the news for a pretty long time now, at least from early this year. I don't see any reason why the memorandum of understanding between Namibia and India is still a secret, despite multiple attempts through the use of the Right to Information Act to get it. The official response to the Indian Express article just says, we have not received a written request. That doesn't mean phone calls were not made. So. Given that information is being withheld, we can only speculate. I don't know whether from the African side they have any insights on that. Anybody who have insights there to share? Okay. 
Um, there's uh, the last um, comment I'm going to leave again. I can't remember your name, JDB, please, if you will come in and then I'm going to conclude the discussion. Uh, please, JDB, last one. Uh, thanks so much for, for this opportunity. I wanted just to briefly jump in because I see is this debate, oh, there is a different subspecies and it's genetically different. Yes, of course, I think everyone is aware of that and everyone will want you know, in, in an ideal world to preserve this genetic diversity as such and to have this each subspecies thrive but we live in a real world. And in this real world, we can take the example, you know, of white rhinos. White rhinos, the Southern white rhino, got to, I think, below 20, yeah? Uh, and all of them in South Africa. And then it came back, but then the Northern white rhino, which was more abundant at the time, then it went on the verge right now, and we know all the situation. And still people, you know, insisting in keeping the two rhino subspecies uh, distinct. So in such a case, I think when you have, you know, a genetic bottleneck, you have inbreeding, you need some fresh blood from the very same species. So in this kind of extreme situations, actually keeping separate subspecies is not making a great service. I understand that in the case of rhinos, they may be a more resistant species to this kind of bottlenecks, but this is not the same true for other species. So uh, maybe if the rhinos will make it somehow, it is not sure that other species like cheetah, uh, like bison, for instance, you know, European bison, an example I know very well, uh, is not sure they will really make it because all this inbreeding, uh, you know, and having all the new population based on just 12 or 20 individuals. That is why I think, you know, that all these people getting enthusiastic about keeping subspecies alive, that is true in an, in an ideal world. But in a world where we have the genetic bottlenecks, at least on one side, of, at least for one subspecies, if not for, for all, then I think we have to look beyond that. We have to look to the survival of the species as such of the species as such. And here, you know, cheetah, they fulfill exactly the same role in their ecosystems. They were animals similar to cheetah also in North America. That is why pronghorn, you know, the pronghorn antelopes are so fast, not because they are running from wolves in Yellowstone, yeah? Because they even don't run from wolves. They know that wolves cannot get them, yeah? So that is why I think we have to look beyond that. Uh, I think one of the colleagues intervened and uh, shared his experience with moving cheetah from one reserve to another, from a drier environment to, to a less drier or, or vice versa, and cheetah adapted to that. So I think we have to keep all these considerations in mind. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, thank you very much, Robin Cook. I'm not going to allow any further uh, comments or discussions. Firstly, thanks to everybody for um, a very interesting debate. Um, thank you, Ravi, again for being very clear on your position. Um, and now I'm just sharing with you from a perspective of somebody who has to answer to people who say, well, why don't we take Rhino to Australia. And I have to listen to many, many specialists. And I think I should start by saying, firstly, we have to address all legal matters, whether it is national, national legislation, laws and bylaws, whether it's international, whether we are with or not with CITES, these are quite complex variables. I also think that we have to ask ourselves, 
what is the natural fit within a context, within an environment? What is the natural fit within an ecosystem? We have to ask ourselves how critical is it for the survival of that species to maybe do something that's extraordinary? Um, I would dare to say that one of the first other questions we need to ask is, what is the national priority? And how does it fit into a national action plan? And yeah, I just remind myself that I met a minister once in one of the Africa countries. I prefer never to use examples that identify others. And I shared with the minister that we, as an organization, typically help with public-private partnerships, create foundations for bigger conservation organizations to manage certain areas. And the minister said to me, well, do whatever you want. But minister, what is your national action plan? We want to do the, what fits your plan. No, 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 whatever you want to do, it's okay, you can do it. And I think as responsible people, we also have to be very clear that those things are in place. There is the critical survival of species that we have to consider. We have to consider the social environment and with the social environment comes the political environment, um, which complicates things very often. And then there's trade-offs and money plays a role. Money plays a big role. If a year of trade-offs, whether we talk ivory, whether we talk cheetahs or whatever, like they say in French, and I speak 10 words of French, il est très, très, très compliqué. It is not a simple matter. And I think from a national level, countries have to first answer to themselves nationally. And then we start thinking international. But I just want to say a summary for a person who care for a cheetah or a rhino or whatever species and say, I, 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 I feel I want to contribute and make a difference. It is not such a simple matter because of the variables that play a role. The most important thing I've learned tonight summary from my side is the respect in which this debate happened and i want to thank you everybody for the respect you've shown and listened to each other and yes ravi we invited you to be the main speaker and as Johan earlier also said you did it with absolute respect very clear on your position and that I really want to applaud, like I applaud every other contributor tonight. This talk with the questions and answers will go on YouTube. And of course, everybody has the right to form their own opinion. And I trust for everybody who came in that from your personal perspective, you've also found some answers and some explanations that helped you in your own thinking. And I wish the conservationists of this world all the best with the cause of trying to do the best for conservation, for the protection of biodiversity, and for ensuring that indigenous game is also well protected. Thank you to everybody. Johan, maybe a last word from your side. You're actually the co-host with me. And I'm leaving it to you to say last word. Thank you, Johan. Thank you, Chris. Um, from my side, just a, a massive thank you um, to everybody for the way that they participated. And um, we hope to have more of these debates in the future. Um, and the way that this happened tonight encourages us to, to, go, to go forward with that. 
Thank you, Anne. Thank you to everybody. Thank you, Ravi, for your time. It's hard work to do these things. And uh, we wish you all the best. Good morning to those who are in the USA and good afternoon to those who are uh, somewhere in, 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 uh, in, uh, in Europe. And Marty Jasper, you never ask a question. That's absolutely surprising. And good evening to everybody. And Ravi, it's probably past midnight on your side. Everybody from India. Thank you, and most importantly, passion and commitment is what eventually will be the thing that carries us through all together for a better planet in terms of biodiversity and other matters. Uh, Nandine uh, Rachamani, thanks also for your lovely introduction of Ravi. Wishing you all the best, wishing you all a good night and with much appreciation. Good night, everyone. And good morning.